As announced in my last video I will now present a more realistic model to calculate the surface temperature of the earth without an atmosphere. Before I start with a version of this calculation that is closer to reality, I want to remind the approximations that were made in the minus 18 degrees centigrade model. The Stefan Boltzmann law is applicable for black bodies in thermal equilibrium only. To correct for the earth's reflectivity, a correction factor, 1 minus alpha, was introduced. Alpha is the so-called bond albedo. It is a measure for the reflectivity of a surface. Surfaces that absorb all incoming electromagnetic radiation have an alpha of zero. Surfaces that reflect all incoming electromagnetic radiation have an alpha of one. For the Earth the value of alpha was determined by satellite measurements to be about 0.3. Water, dark wet soil and forests have the lowest albedo. Not far from zero. Snow and clouds have the highest reflectivity with alpha values up to 0.85. The power radiated to the Earth's surface, and therefore the surface temperature, is very variable depending on the Sun's angle of incidence. This makes the application of the Stefan Boltzmann law difficult, since it is only applicable for bodies with a constant surface temperature. This problem was dealt with by averaging out the solar radiation equally over the surface of the Earth. An excuse for this abuse of the Stefan Boltzmann law might be that the fast rotation of the Earth in combination with the fourth root in equation will keep the error small. To avoid this source of error, a model would have to be developed that allows the irradiated power to be calculated at every point on the planet's surface. If one knows the radiated power at every point on the planet's surface, one can use the Stefan Boltzmann law to calculate the surface temperature for every point without having to average the irradiated power over large areas. What we are looking for is a surface temperature distribution function, T of theta, that assigns a temperature to each point on the planet's surface. With such a surface temperature distribution function, one can then calculate the mean surface temperature of the planet, practically error-free. This sounds quite hypothetical. But thanks to the Lunar Diviner experiment, we have such detailed data on the surface temperature of the Moon, that the surface temperature distribution function, T of theta, required above, can be determined for the Moon. With this data, our moon becomes the ideal model for a celestial body without an atmosphere. When analyzing the temperature data from the Lunar Diviner mission, it turns out that on the sunny side of the moon, the surface temperatures are very well described by the Stefan Boltzmann law, when the angle of incidence of the solar radiation, theta, is taken into account. According to William et al., the surface temperature distribution function, T of theta, is as follows. T of theta equals the fourth square root of 1 minus alpha s0 cosinus theta over sigma with the solar elevation angle theta the albedo of the moon alpha equals 0.11 and the stefan boltzmann constant sigma near the poles the solar elevation angle theta approaches 90 degrees this means that the cosinus theta approaches zero and very little power is radiated the surface there is then very cold at the equator when the sun is at its highest point theta equals zero. Dot there, the cosinus theta equals one. The full power S zero is irradiated vertically, and the power, one minus alpha, times S zero is absorbed. The highest surface temperature is measured here. Concentric circles with the same angle of incidence and thus the same temperature are thus formed around the point of the sun's highest point. The shadow side of the moon is not considered further. It simply cools down overnight and is heated up again the next day. Uli Weber proposed to use this temperature distribution function to calculate the Earth's surface temperature without an atmosphere. He presented a numerical solution for this problem, which is described on the website of Ike. When transferring the Moon model to earthly conditions, we simply replace the albedo of the Moon with the albedo of the Earth. This means that although we calculate without an atmosphere, the reflection of sunlight on clouds and water surfaces is taken into account. The temperature distribution function T of theta divides the sunny side of the Earth into concentric circles with the same surface temperature. In this video I will use Uli Weber's proposal to calculate the Earth's surface temperature without an atmosphere via an integral solution. For the integral solution we make the area element dA of these circles infinitesimal narrow and express them as a function of theta. For convenience we rearrange the surface temperature distribution function a bit. 
Then the area averaged mean temperature of the sunlit hemisphere, Tm, is calculated by forming the area integral of the surface temperature distribution function, T of theta, over the sunlit hemisphere, and then dividing by the area of the hemisphere, with an area averaged average temperature of Tm equals 15.4 degrees centigrade, the integral solution gives a result that is surprisingly close to the average temperature of 15.5 degrees centigrade specified by the IPCC and determined by weather station measurements as the global mean temperature of the Earth. Not much is left when we now calculate the greenhouse effect with this temperature of an Earth without an atmosphere. The greenhouse effect of 0.1 degrees centigrade might be sufficiently large to continue academic discussions, but for all practical purposes it is nothing. It may seem a bit far-fetched to transfer the moon's surface temperature distribution function to the Earth. Therefore I want to compare the diurnal temperature cycle of both celestial bodies with each other. The moon day is by a factor of about 28 longer than an Earth day. Therefore the moon surface has much more time to heat up and to cool down. Together with the low heat capacity of the moon's surface, this results in bigger temperature differences between day and night. Due to the slower rotation and the relatively small heat capacity of the dry moon surface, the temperature curve of the moon is quite symmetrical. Due to the Earth's high rotation speed and high heat capacity of its surface, the surface temperature maximum lags behind the zenith of the sun. The high rotation speed of the Earth shortens the heating in the cooling period of the day, and thus results in smaller temperature differences between day and night. Also the cooling periods of Noom and Earth look not that different. Accordingly, it does not seem to be the mysterious back radiation of greenhouse gases that makes the Earth habitable. The Earth's mild climate is more likely to be owed to its rapid rotation and the large heat capacity of its surface and atmosphere. The latent heat that is converted during phase transitions of water also contributes to the high heat capacity of the atmosphere and the Earth's surface. Before I come to a final conclusion, I want to check how errors or changes in the albedo, alpha, influence the result of this calculation. For this purpose I plotted the mean Earth surface temperature as a function of the albedo, alpha. In this graph we can see that we need a quite high albedo, of about 0.58 to achieve the minus 18 degrees centigrade needed for a 33 degrees centigrade greenhouse effect. This would be a kind of snowball earth or an earth completely covered in thick clouds. At least according to the albedos given in Wikipedia. The biggest factor of uncertainty in this calculation is the albedo. That means that changes in cloud cover or volcanic eruptions are the spoilers in attempts to model the climate. The conclusion of this calculation is that if you let the sun shine on only one side of the Earth, as in real life, and use the results of the lunar diviner experiment to calculate the average surface temperature of the Earth, the atmospheric greenhouse effect is simply gone. In the next video I will talk about the spectroscopy of the greenhouse effect and what happens when CO2 molecules interact with infrared radiation.